I'm Jessica Tanner, I'm assistant professor in French in the Department of Roman Studies here with the 19th century French. Uh, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce this evening's speaker, Janet Beiser, who is professor of Romance Languages and Literatures at Harvard University, and whom I'm honored to have been able to call at various times my dissertation advisor, a mentor, a patient reader, and a law interlocutor, tolerator of frenzy and procrastination, cooking guru, and friend. <laughs> I first met Janet at Harvard in 2003 when I enrolled in her seminar on hysteria in 19th century France. Though I had been there as an undergrad, I hadn't yet met Janet, who was still um, at UVA when I was an undergrad and came after I graduated. And when I enrolled in the Hysteria course, it was as an interloper. I had co-majored in French as an undergrad, but I had actually started graduate school in Spanish, planning only to take a few courses in French as a secondary field. Intimidated by the stack of Zola novels we were to read, and my graduate students might protest that I'm also inspired by the epic stack of Zola novels, uh, to their chagrin. Uh, and yet invigorated by the masterful connections that Janet made between narrative, theory, criticism, and medical discourse, I felt myself drawn further back into French with every passing week, and was grateful when Janet agreed to adopt me as her student, a decision she hopefully regretted no more than two or three dozen times in the years that followed. The course that changed the course of my academic career stemmed from Janet's field-changing work in ventriloquized bodies, narratives of hysteria in 19th century France, published by Cornell University Press in 1994, for which she won the Emily Aldo and Jean Scaglione Prize for Best Book in French and Francophone Studies. In incisive readings of medical and historical narratives, letters and novels by Curie, Flaubert, Ducan, Zola, and Hachim, and others, Ventriloquized Bodies explores the centrality of discourses of hysteria in 19th century France, identifying the pathologizing and ventriloquizing of women's bodies by doctors and authors, who appropriated their narrative by coding their expressions as disorder and inarticulate noise. In pointing to the silencing of women by literary and medical discourse, Ventriloquized Bodies anticipates the concern of her next book, Thinking Through the Mothers, Reimagining Women's Biographies, published by Cornell in 2009, which explores what she terms salvation biographies, contemporary women's biographies of other women that appropriate the past as a bioautography, a writing of the self through the voicing of another's life. Pondering how one might read and write past lives not appropriately, the book revises conventional feminist readings of women's life writing by encouraging us to attend to the silences, gaps, and elisions, rather than covering them over with a retrospective voice. And I should mention that in addition to these two works, Janet has also published a seminal, seminal monograph on Balzac, uh, Family Plots, Balzac's Narrative Generations, published by Yale, and countless articles on topics ranging from history and narrative to motherhood to travel writing and fugue. And finally, I just want to add on a personal note that beyond her path-breaking scholarship, Janet is also a generous mentor who fostered intellectual community by inviting her graduate students to gather and share work in progress over dinner at informal cénacle, and provided guidance and feedback beyond any reasonable expectation. It is also a particular pleasure to welcome her to Chapel Hill in the context of this conference that has been so expertly and thoughtfully organized by graduate students in the Department of Women's Studies. <laughs> uh, and so shout out to them for all of their hard work uh, on the conference. Janet's talk this evening is part of her current book project entitled The Harlequin Leaders, The Patchwork Imaginary in 19th Century Paris, which she will continue to develop as a fellow, to develop as a fellow at the Stanford Humanities Center during the 2016-17 academic year. In the meantime, we are delighted to have her here to present part of her work on this book in a talk entitled Devil's Food Soup, Constructing the People's Palette. Please join me in welcoming Professor Janet. <laughs>
becomes a refrain, an invitation to view the world with fractured vision, kaleidoscopic spirit, and delight in reshuffling forms. Today, I'll be showing you other horizons, precursors of Milakov's opalescent trees, prismatic acrobats, crystal rainbows, and iridescent butterfly wings. I'll ask you to call on all your senses, especially your proximal ones, to smell them, taste them, feel them passing through your mouth and your gut. My horizons are elementary. They go back element, not elementary. <laughs> <laughs> they go back almost two centuries before the book and are usually presented in less celestial terms than his. I'll turn first to Eugène Sue's 1842 definition of the term, apparently still exotic enough then to acquire an explanatory note in his uh, Mystère de Paris. A harlequin is a collection of meat, fish, and all kinds of leftovers coming from the clear tables of the servants of upper-class upper homes. Sue's character, Le Chourneur, which has recently been translated as the slasher, uh, Le Chourineur more elaborately <coughs> describes the place set before him at the Cabaret de la Femme. His ode is as revealing of Sue's disgust as it is of the diner's relish. And let me just say that the way I'm going to handle the quotes from French is uh, that I will speak them for the most part in English, but the longer ones I'll put up in French. And I'll only <coughs> use the French when the wording is Uh, what a dish, God Almighty. It's like an omnibus. There's something for all tastes, for those who eat meat and those who don't, for those who like sugar and those who like spice. Chicken drumsticks, biscuits, pieces, fish tails, rib bones, pate crust, fried bits, cheese, vegetables, woodcock head, salad. Go on, go on, eat up. This is refined food. The comparison of a dinner plate to an omnibus, 14 years after the introduction of this mode of public transport <coughs> in Paris, is of course fraught with meaning and affect. As Marcia Blanke has taught us, the omnibus appeared to many contemporary observers as a ravenous monster whose enormous size and indiscriminate palate fostered chaos and disorder, both in the streets of Paris and within the established social. This monster, a veritable Proteus, is conjured up now in the shape of the Harlequin. The place, the institution, because it is an institution, I'll argue, uh, that indiscriminate, indiscriminately mixed the likes of drumsticks, fishtails, and pate crust, and also commingled upper crust diners at the lowest of bottom feeders through the unrestrained circulation of food across classes was cause for anxiety, fear, and disdain. Any doubt about Sue's tone might be dispelled by the last sentence of the footnote I began to quote earlier. It is, we are ashamed of these details. They contribute to the ensemble of such menus. I say might dispel uh, the doubts, our doubts, because in fact, it isn't clear whether the shame is to be attributed to commiseration with the plight of fellow humans at the bottom of the social hierarchy condemned to continue relevant to the higher order, or to a potential offense whose details might deliver to the taste and sensibility of his bourgeois reader. <laughs> it's precisely the carefully crafted ambiguity of this phrasing that begins to demonstrate the hypocrisy of his discourse. And so is not alone in his double-voiced presentation of the Harlequin. It's in fact a consistent trait of 19th century commentators that's carried over through the intervening years to the present with a great degree of frequency. My purpose today is to take a closer look at this discourse of mingled pity, contempt, and disgust to begin to understand what it is about the plates of secondhand food, which Jean-Paul Aron refers to as second mouth meals, <coughs> les consommations de deuxième bouche. <laughs> what it is about them that elicits such a gut and many reactions. So you might think this is self-evident. But I want to get beyond the knee-jerk reaction that this practice produces, um, and to which I was certainly very susceptible when I first came to this project. It turns out that it's really hard to find the right tone 
with which to talk about disgust, because one risks either falling into, either sharing the patronizing voices of the disgusted, or taking one's distance from these commentators, and that slides into another kind of patronization of condescension. Going back to the book, if I use his airy harlequin that is of such different allure from my much earthier one as an introduction to this one, it's to indicate an arc from the Bacchus abstracted acro acrobat harlequin back to the patchwork harlequin mule. Itself, harkening back to the Italian comedy ballet, Arlecchino, with his lavishly, uh, garishly spangled suit and carnivalesque reversal. Um, and so this is kind of the typical Arlecchino as he's, um, uh, as he's become stylized. You can see the suit, you know, you all know it. It has the diamond or checkered pattern, all the different colors. If you go back even earlier, these are some illustrations from Maurice Saint's book, Vincent's son, a big specialist of Commedia dell'arte. You see that at the very beginning, before the costume got stylized, <coughs> instead of diamonds or checkers, there were kind of splotches and stains, spots. And I'll come back to this. Later. Um, so, and then on the other end, before getting to the 19th century and early 20th century elementary Arlequin, we have to make stops at Marivaux, Zola, and Picasso. The art so described, which is also that of my book project, would correspond to the evolution of the Harlequin figure as just that, as a figure, as an aesthetic and sociopolitical and rhetorical figure and also to its various cultural appropriations, manifestations, and subversions. So that's the overview. In what follows, I, join you, I, I invite you to join me in the much more concrete exercise of staring down on my plate. Um, <laughs> so to start, I'm going to show you a couple of images of Harlequin stands, the stands where Harlequin's plates were sold by Harlequin merchants, um, with the warning that they tease more than they show. After a couple of images. Um, late 19th century, I don't know the exact day. <coughs> 1890, from the magazine de l'Illustration. Um, sometime during the Second Empire, uh, so a little bit earlier. Um, This one around the turn of the century, around 1900. Uh, so you see the people lining up. You can almost vaguely see the plates that they're waiting to buy. Uh, this one's around 1905. Um, you think you can see them, you want to see them. It's really frustrating because you can't quite see what's on the plates. The textual commentary on quite a bit more explicit. This is one of the one of those cases where a sentence is worth a thousand pictures. <laughs> or, I don't know, at least a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> so let's listen to the Harlequin as described by a number of narrators. There's an astonishing continuity across accounts from which I'll choose some representative excerpt to begin to tell the story. And when I say tell the story, I mean perhaps less of the Harlequin plate than of the cultural imaginary that produced the Harlequin narrative. For Alexandre Privatin, Le Mans writing not too many years after, <coughs> a tour of the Harlequin cellars comes 
commentary on the part of some practice, and also is typically overshadowed, as here, by what seems to me to be a more authentic combination of disgust, derision, and fascination. The accompanying juxtaposition of animals and the hungry lower classes is also standard fare in renditions of the Harlequin stand. Mm -hmm. For some narrators, animals are the last stop for feed that's unfit for even the lowliest of humans. Pierre Hon, for example, recounts the cycle of recycling as he witnessed it in the restaurant where he apprenticed in the late 1880s. From the residues of scraped dinner plates, the mess would be put aside for the Harlequin sellers whatever scraps still kept a little substance, held on to a semblance of slice or piece. Whatever was runny or pulpy was given to the beggars to clean up. The rotted parts were thrown into barrels to be sold to pig farmers. The food cycle, which began in the vegetable garden, the herd, and the flock, ended in the dung heap and the pig sty. So just notice in passing how the descending socioeconomic and evolutionary order is commensurate with the hierarchization of matter that runs from solid and firm to chunky and mushy to viscous and runny to liquid. I'll come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> For other commentators, beasts are not mere beneficiaries of talkers to start, but their rightful match in the struggle to eat. Jacques de Castelnau calls the Harlequin seller, sell, call, sorry, calls the Harlequin sellers the fiercest competitors of dogs, cats, and pigs. They literally take bread from animal dogs. The visual and literary iconography of Harlequin century consistently has consumers buying with animals for their sustenance. Tales of legion, dishwashers turning a profit by selling off to the pig farmers on the spot, did invest the dismet for charitable handouts. According to A. Capignon, if the Harlequin stands were first providers for the good souls that spoiled their little dogs, it was also the case that many people looked to Harlequin place as a source for a cheap yield. Paintings, engravings, cartoons, photographs of Harlequin merchants typically feature a dog crouching beneath book two or three, crouching beneath the, the display table, which I would argue are both naturalist detail and ideological commentary. Let me show you a few of those. Um, so you see, yeah, under the table, there's a big dog. Uh, this one is on the left, on the very left of the table. The next one also on the left, just um, a couple of dogs <laughs> under the table, and the Harlequin vendor who has a pig's head also has a kind of pig's head herself. So <laughs> um, okay. Written accounts frequently expose a thin conceit that the food being purchased for a pet, that the food is being purchased for a pet at home, as in the exchange reported by Pierre Ambert, in which the customer requests a ragu for his dog, and the vendor replies, uh, I have exactly what you need, a delicious dish from the kitchens of Monsieur the Count of the Silver Fruit. I had some for breakfast, and I'm still licking my fingers. It's exquisite. It's a shame that the dog will be eating it. This is food worthy of a Christian. <laughs> The author, the joke he hears on the seller, who condescends to her low-life buyer's vain distinction between himself and the dog, <coughs> or her own finger-looking behavior shows her to be no better than either one of them. And of course it's relevant that the popular term said for the lowborn, the riffraff, la canaille, comes from the Latin for dog. People are the dog. So we see in Chronicles of the Harlequin a familiar naturalizing discourse that assimilates the poor to the savage, the uncivilized, the creature. And um, let's remember a tangible false blossom of naturalism in much the same term. Uh, we begin with the rabble, and the word he uses is la canaille. We begin with the rabble because the man and woman of the people are close. 
it should all remain separate. On plates of all shapes and dimensions, we find displayed foods destined for consumers of all classes and even all species, men, dogs, or cats. We see objects whose nature is difficult to determine. Fish mixed in with scraps of roast beef and salad. Everything is to be thought there. It's important to distinguish the Harlequin plate from a host of other equally unappealing and insalubrious practices of an era that emphasized not letting anything go to waste, even if spoiled. A few examples. Uh, butter fallen underfoot was reserved for friends. Blood ends of cigars were recycled uh, by a specialized tradesman who ferreted out tobacco filaments one by one, using the Hamasaf for these cigars. Bread ends gathered from schoolyards and refuse bins were sorted for crouton, uh, soup thickener, and tooth powder, depending on how much of it, of it was left and how dirty it was. <laughs> Deteriorating fish was cosmetically blood in the gills. Decaying oysters were soaked in salt water until they pumped up enough to put sail at bargain rates. But if fraud and indifference to consumer health were rampant, they didn't elicit the same degree of shock narrative, fascinating detail, and disgusted marveling that the Harlequin did. Neither did the marketing of other leftovers, ranging from single item plates, for instance, a dish of cold fried fish, or a plate of almost or the crown jewel of dinner vestiges, le jus, jewel, which generally it was leftovers, but there was more meat on the bone, and the plate was assembled around an identifiable piece of meat, even a bit. But none of this elicited the same degree of shock and disgust as the harbinger. So here are some speculations about why this might be the case. The defining, the unforgivable feature of the Harlequin is its relentless recombining and blending of ingredients, the mixing of separate parts that threaten to lose their identity. Michel Castoreau reminds us that Leviticus prohibits practices of mixing and that modern Occidental culture is still permeated by the medieval scandal of variegation. The belief that the solid and the monochromatic are godly while the model spotted are diabolical. And you might hear think about the early Harlequin costume with its, its spots and its stains. Like the omnibus, the Harlequin is monstrous, ungodly in its omnivorous palette, its confusion of too many disparate elements, its promiscuity.
sight of nature rather than culture. Among other things, this means risking confusion, confusion, falling onto the wrong side, the far side of meaning. From the 17th century on, uh, uh, non-rigu was the name for a plate that combined entree and dessert, taking the diner and the semiotic of dining in two directions at once. In 1808, uh, Alexandre Balthazar Laurent Grimaud de la Reynière, ultimate astronomer and food snob of the post-revolutionary era, decried the unrigu, declaring it a practice acceptable only at lunchtime. Why? Because lunch was already meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> he called it un repas sans conséquence. <laughs> and therefore, lunch could tolerate an indiscriminate juxtaposition that everywhere else, and I quote, is repugnant to a refined guest fond of order and propriety. The contradiction of courses offered by an unhuge, in other words, was improper, unclean, polluting, what Mary Douglas might call matter of place. How much more ambiguous, how much more likely to pollute was the harlequin, which crowded fragments of an entire meal, or two or three meals, onto the surface of a single plate, and in so doing, managed to transgress social, cultural, aesthetic, and symbiotic categories. So why? Lest we forget, this is also the era whose culinary style is revolutionized by Carrel's emphasis on separating and simplifying rather than piling up flavors and ingredients. As Jean-François Robert describes, the art of Carême didn't aim to superimpose flavors, but rather to isolate and emphasize them. Grande cuisine, for him, was not, as is too often presumed, the barbaric accumulation of heterogeneous and excessive products, but the preservation of a dominant note in the final preparation. From the vantage point of the well milled and well fed, the Harlequin then constituted the antithesis of grand cuisine. It was le degré zéro de l'alimentation, zero degree of eating. How then, for even Harlequin, a horror and hierarchy, how then should we plumb the depths of their lowest incarnation, Harlequin soup? In fact, that's not a very good metaphor. To revise the metaphor, for the substance sold by street merchants as soup was typically so thoroughly lacking in substance, so liquefied, so flat, that it was common practice to hire a specialized employee to blow fish oil through his teeth to make beads on the surface of the liquid in order to give it the illusion of death. Oh, yeah. This fish employee had a special name. He was called L'Empoyé aux yeux de bouillon. <laughs> So, I don't know, I, I would translate it as the bullion bead maker. <laughs> so, you know, it's literally the bullion eye maker, this circle of, 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 of fat called eye. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, you could just imagine this person standing there shooting fish oil through his teeth. <laughs> um, in other words, where, on the scale of ignominy, do we place soup, the product of ingredients scraped from the top of the sink and the bottom of the barrel, the epitome of Harlequin and discrimination? Lowest in the lowly trio, containing also stews and ragu, soup constitutes the nadir of the Harlequin, and logically the American classification of sub-zero in the elementary. But to be clear, it's less the precise numerical ranking of the Harlequin that preoccupies me and more its topographical semantics. As we've seen, narratives of the Harlequin represented consistently from above, looking down, way down, to the bottom of whatever socioeconomic or aesthetic ladder is being used. It's seen as fail, it's plotted in dark corners, murky alleyways, marginalized urban outskirts, down a sloping street around the bend in the Mr. Twisted Lane, glimpsed from an overlooking window. This is, you know, this is how it is presented. The base matter, gathered from the kitchen of the upper crust under cover of night and shadow, and pails and bats and trucks, is delivered for triage. The dis 
diving to the subterranean depths of Le'ad, Le'ad, Le'ad. It is here that the discourse of the Harlequin begins to converge with representations of the urban court, the Bastion, or the underworld, so stunningly described in recent years by Dominique Khalifa and by David Pike. Khalifa locates the archetypal scene of indigence, tightly bundled with vice and crime in the 19th century imaginary, in the pre Osmanian Paris street, overpopulated, um, overpopulated, overheated, dirty, oozing, labyrinthine, black, dark, mucked up, a topographical and symbolic reality related to hell and the descent to hell. What's at stake is not only the underworld, but the, the downward slope leading there. This sounds remarkably similar to the imaginary of the Harlequin, and the county fund might as well be offering us a sample of Harlequin's suit <coughs> when he summarizes representations of the role social order. Way down at the bottom we find water, stagnant, stinking, putrid water, sewage, the classical representations of hell ordered by the stick, river of the dead. The entire electrical field is liquid. The references are ditches, sewers, chasms, abysses. Poverty is a stagnant swamp. Of human misery before our stump. Listen now to Jay Barbara's description of soup making. With the grease skimmed off dirty beer water, supplemented by water, the merchants set bouillon cooking, to which they add the remains of mashed potatoes, beans, other vegetables, and any crusts of bread they have picked up. Uh, I actually have a couple of pictures of soup makers. Or soup well, soup makers, soup sellers, they often did it on the street. So, and, you know, the, the, the protocol was you just stood and drank your soup. They would give you a chipped bowl, um, and you would just stand there and get back to bowl. I've often wondered if they washed the bowls. <laughs> Uh, 
belly of Paris, we go to Paris and we see uh, the myriad of things that were done there. I actually have a slide that shows, um, uh, so you see the manipulation of butter. So, you know, one way to kind of spread butter and get a higher price for what was no longer good would be to mix rancid butter with butter that was still kind of okay, and you get something in between, and then to color it with various things so that it looks like, you know, look healthier. Um, and and uh, uh, I don't know, stuffing various animals, um, uh, plucking chicken, cutting up uh, animal carcasses, so the animals were killed elsewhere, because at a certain point, to the slaughtering of animals and the butchering of animals were radically separated. You couldn't have that done. The slaughtering was done on the outskirts of Paris, and then the butchering was done on the ground. Um, but again, you see the topographical difference. You know, uh, uh, what was dirty and unclean and, and, and polluted had to be done on the ground. Um, Any narrative use of we, which happens a lot uh, in these descriptions, is a rhetorical flourish to emphasize distance from the matter at hand, as in Aron's description <coughs> of harlequins as products of a hierarchized system whose increasingly <coughs> hallucinatory downward slope, uh, we slip down from vestige to refuse, from refuse to decomposition transitions are imperceptible. But the object of the gaze directed down upon the slops in the cauldron below is only secondarily the genetic food. It's first and foremost, if not explicitly, the disparate horde of human cast offs mirroring the elementary degree. Here's a just a testimony of lurid but typical description of a holocaust piece. Everything is poured into a huge pot and reheated. The sauce is blended banquet prepared, the parade of guests begins. begins. They present all that is most pitiable in human comedy. Haggard, emaciated faces, waxen complexions, hunched backs, frail limbs, clad in rags, eyes either lit up by the result or extinguished by reputation. The garbage stew and the human stew are parallel constructs. And now they seem <coughs> mixing, each deserving and determinative of the other. So it's no accident that Aron's chosen term for putrefying food, like denaturation, denaturation, recalls naturalism, or less euphemistically, subnaturalism, to extend David Gibson's term of subnature from the architectural to the literary. For Gibson, who I think spent some time down here last year, um, I don't know if any of you know him, uh, but anyway, for Gibson, um, subnature refers to elements conventionally, conventionally excluded from the built environment, elements such as mud, uh, darkness, dankness, smoke, dust, debris, and so on. By analogy, I suggest that naturalism, as defined and performed by its 19th century literary practitioners, is in fact a subnaturalism, putting into circulation parts of nature conventionally barred from the textual environment and then exoticized denigrated as a kind of anti-nature. Conjoined to representations of repurposed rich people's food as hybrid semi-digestive sewerage, devil soup, are familiar renditions of the people as rotting matter, infernal drainage. The trickling down of my <coughs> repast, the viscous soup pot horrifies, not just because it provokes the gag reflex, but also because it prefigures proximity and permeability of classes diets and categories of every order, most notably digestion and alimentation and death and life. What I've been calling devil soup and harlequin soup finds an echo in William Ian Miller's life soup, a model for disgust, his model for disgust, based on the cyclical nature of death and life. And I quote Miller here, images of decay that slide into images of fertility and elegance, the having lived and the living that unite to make up the organic world of rot. For Miller, quote, life soup, seething, roiling, oozing, discussed not because all ends in death, but because there is no fixed point. That is no fixed distinction. All is flux. 
unmerited manifestations of harlequin soup, the devil soup, which is to say as much death soup as life soup. I also want to understand disgust, in this case the heightened rhetoric of disgust that characterizes harlequin's description in the tone of revulsion that accompanies them. For Louis Sebastien Mercier, uh, in his tableau de Paris, the operative in it is saliva. He evokes these disgusting scraps the certain people ruled on. Terrasse de distance with the la vache For Emile Zola, it is intestinal gases. His chosen harlequin figure is the filth belched up at the Tuileries. Les sacs sur lesquels on avait rossé Pierre Ampf epitomizes harlequin as vomit. The vomited remains of the uh, diner which he further elaborates as cadaverous flops, the cadavres It leads on other discursive recoiling on the part of bourgeois commentators who can also detect certain unspoken pleasure taken in the lively clinical detailing of the places the harlequin scraps might have been in the digestive and pre-digestive processes of first-hand diners, the body fluid that might have encountered, and the signs of the journey such scraps might bear, such as Already, the overlapping and combining of elements in the mixed plate on which different dishes fuse and different courses merge suggests the composition and the formlessness of the soup or stew whose constituent ingredients have disappeared suggests digestion. As Margaret Visser has said, anything mashed suggests chewing, to which we might add that anything chewed suggests violence. The idea of eating the remains of other people's dinners, especially when they're marred, when they've lost their integrity, implies partaking of the body of those others, inasmuch as the dinner remains, those who had the right of first refusal, have at least potentially crossed their lips, and maybe more than their lips. Ingesting food that has symbolically or literally passed into the oral or other body cavity from another person suggests by synecdoche swallowing a piece of that other. The horror of harlequin soup is the dread of its indistinguishable ingredients, the unknowability of its sources. We like to know what is being eaten so that we don't need to wonder who is being eaten. The specter of cannibalism presented by the harlequin and char characters exaggerated by its preparation as soup is no mere abstraction. If we return to the scene of the Harlequin meal from the beginning of my paper, and more critically from the beginning of Sue's Mystère pour Paris, we find ourselves once again before the composite dish compared to an omnibus by a courageous consumer. <coughs> again, I remind you, named after the modern transport whose perturbingly homogenizing effect it shares, this elementary on the bus, I argued, was also a ravenous monster whose indiscriminate palate fostered chaos and disorder. Quoting again my colleague Marcia Belenke on Paris bus history. If it seems odd to personify a plate of food as a palate, at once rapacious, ravenous, indiscriminate, and disordering, I would recall how often we seem here and in collapse by the commentary with the popular consumers taking on uh, the shabby heterocritic appearance of their food to suggest that here, too, we find the description of the food plate conflated with an observation of its brutish, gaping mouth consumer. It's only at the end of Sue's novel that we encounter for the first time in 1,300-plus pages the concept of the cannibalistic that was introduced by implication in the early Harlequin scene finally articulated, cast into language, as the word cannibal. Here, the epithet, uh, which is part of the phrase cannibal threats, is prompted by the savage, violent behavior of a mob of drunken people milling about in the street. This is, of course, evil crowd that almost succeeds in mastering the novel's hero and heroine. Understanding the early and later scenes together, the Harlequin scene uh, and the cannibal scene, we can elucidate 
Oh, sorry, you can understand them together as a mutually completing frame for the body of the novel, and then elucidate the continuity that comprises the crowded Harlequin plate, the vulgar devouring consumer, and the cannibalizing collectivity, all made in the same way, <coughs> all contributing to a hideous mosaic construction of the people's power, the people as power, the cannibal's power, and the colossal engulfing laws. In this light, I would now venture to account for the failure of my long and frustrated quest for legible images of the Harlequin plate, for pictures that would delineate its content in a sharp and defined manner, instead of turning us as viewers into my buyers. The blurred and fuzzy shots, the puzzling discreteness, are not, I propose, results of the state of photography at the turn of the century, or of stylized techniques of painting and engraving or even of a hesitation to turn ignoble matters into aesthetic subjects. All possible explanations that have seriously occurred to me for the lack of focus. In fact, the real visual object of these images is not, I think, their ostensible blurry subjects at all. The fuzziness that both attracts and diverts our gaze is a decoy. Harlequin soup, harlequin plate, harlequin food, serve merely to deflect the spectator's glance from the focal spectacle of the murderous masses projected as the scene of this menacing creature. Venezuela, we have a dish, the, the main um, dish for Christmas is, well, it's hard to explain, it's kind of like a tamale, but it comes from colonial times when uh, the Spanish had their meal, their big um, holiday meal, and then the leftovers were put in a banana leaf and then mixed with uh, corn flour, but this was all made of the leftovers of the rich, and it was the servants that made this. Nowadays we have this dish, but it's not made out of le leftovers at all. It, of course, we make 
all of these things that were before just leftovers we make from scratch right. to eat, but we still have the dish. It's just that now we buy food to make it, and it's not. So I was wondering if there's any kind of um, trace that can be made back to this kind of soup in modern day French cuisine. Did it evolve into something? Well, the French find this kind of thing disgusting, and you know, in fact, I thought I thought about titling this talk "Why the French Hate Doggy Bags." There's <laughs> <laughs> been a lot of publicity recently about that in, um, in Lyon, and now a couple of years ago in Lyon, and now in Paris, they have um, uh, well. Ecologically minded people, people in the including people in the government, have passed laws. Um, the most recent one was a law passed in Paris saying people had to be offered doggy bags, and they have a different name for it now because the French don't like that name, probably because of this whole heritage. Um, but that people have to be offered leftovers to take home because it's too wasteful not to. Um, but the French are usually disgusted by this because they associate it with poverty and um, they don't like it. So, I mean, I think we all have stories of this. My grandfather used to make a dish of leftovers that he called mishmash. You know, he would take leftover beef and mix, he would slice up potatoes and onions and he would do leftover beef and... Um, you know, it was good, and people who lived through the Depression, for instance, did this, and, you know, I, I certainly use leftovers, and I like imagine, but it's different to be eating your own leftovers than to eat everybody else's. <laughs> On the same token, the, the Brazilian um, national dish, feijoada, is pretty much that. that it's an uh, undesirable parts of, uh, of the pork. That is, uh, yeah. is sterilized by the stewing again. Mm -hmm. And uh, but as my understanding, it was at the beginning like literally leftovers from 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 the kind of the landlords. That it was it's sterilized. Or or yes. Uh -huh, the servants would uh, pretty much uh, just make it into a stew, and then all the undesirable parts of the food. Right. Mm -hmm. right. right. yeah. And another question. Uh, is there any indication that when you're talking about the topography, there are many cultures uh, that I understand that did use the topography because of the conservation of, uh, especially meat underground, it's, it's, it's longer. Is, did you find any relation to that, or just that it was truly not out of sight, they didn't want to deal with Well, it didn't stay underground. They would cut it up underground. That was where they did the butchering, but then it was brought above ground to Right. So, you know, I think they, obviously they didn't have mud in refrigeration, but they had blocks of ice and things like that.
painting or to be gathering little bits and pieces and recycling it and putting it to other purposes and being subversive about it. So, yeah. And just in terms of modern times, um, where I live, there have been, okay, there's um, the former CEO of Trader Joe's. His name is, I forget his first name, it's like Gary or Barney uh, Rauch, R-A-U-C-H, or Rauch, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, trying to give this food away for free, um, not wanting to create, instead of there being a, a stigma that can be associated with food banks, for example, um, such a stigma, he was trying to create a, like, well, anybody can have it. Um, upper class white people can come and have the food if they want it. So some kind of use the stigma. I thought that was yeah. um, interesting way to start, start this question. But 
So I was going to ask is um, a lot of what you were saying during your talk made me think of, for example, the saliva and bodily fluids, and um, when you think of Julia Kristeva's ideas about the object. Yeah. And I was wondering how you feel that that sort of car carries into this. Um, and then my other question is related to when you're talking about how um, not being able to see the plates themselves and how, how fuzzy you can never quite. You, want, you have this desire to you see what's on the plate. Mm -hmm. That made me think of this um, this habit we seem to have today of um, so-called foodies that take <laughs> a picture <laughs> of their food so that it's very clear what is on right. the plate, right. and you post it on Facebook, and you a lot of times you describe exactly what is on the plate in addition to the picture. <laughs> so, that almost makes you feel that there's sort of a connection there. This idea of like you want a crystal clear picture of the food. It doesn't matter if you're sitting at the table, but it's the right. food that matters. Right, right, right. And that's another thing that is really found on the No, I 
to that sort of aesthetics and the way that you were describing yeah. these plates and the, the emotional reactions to them. Um, well, there's the reactions of the people buying them and there's the reactions of the bourgeois people watching or writing about it. And those are very different. And, you know, that's why I think it was of interest to artists, um, Picasso and his
images, I think, more when you think we'd be disgusted by because you have to have a tendency to think familiar things are less gross. Like, you know, you'll share a food with a friend, but you wouldn't share it with a stranger necessarily. You know, that's a very common practice. Um, right. Do you see, I mean, do you see that sort of um, irony or, or Did you say inversion or ad Yeah, ad subversion, subversion, perhaps, if it were doing, being done on purpose, but, um, you know, it's almost the opposite of what you would kind of, kind of think, you know, why are you so concerned with the practices, the disgusting practices of poor people when they're eating, you know, your leftover food? Is it because they're eating you? Is it because Yeah, you know, I think that's it? what it is. I think it's because, I think it's a fear of the crowd, a fear of the love, and, you know, the devouring horror. I mean, I, I know we're kind of talking about Paris here, but what did this happen in other European centers? So, I'm not sure. All the writing I found is about Paris. I <coughs> suspect that it happened in other, in like, large French cities like Lyon. Um, you need a really good-sized city, I think, to make this be an institution, because there has to be a sizable, wealthy population you know, there has to be a class-based population, there has to be enough food that's left over. Um, I've been told by Irish friends that they've seen or heard references of this happening through Dublin. Um, I suspect it was happening in London and, you know, American cities, but I haven't, I haven't found it. I haven't come across anything. I haven't deliberately looked. <laughs> this is kind of a continuation of the same question, but um, it appears that it was very much um, concentrated in Neyad. But did you find that there were other kind of sections of Paris, maybe yeah. that corresponded to higher rates of poverty, where yeah. this was also happening? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of writing on Neyad. chroniclers of Paris life in the 19th century were all fascinated by the Mayas and the was the belle of Paris, and so they wrote extensively on it. But, um, yeah, it, and it was regulated after about 1860, it was regulated at Mayas and within the city limits. Um, people were not supposed to be selling leftovers on carts. What could be sold by um, um, and you and uh merchants, um uh, traveling merchants, I don't know. Traveling salesmen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What could be sold but I mean the not I don't know how to translate that. But what could be sold on the move was regulated. Some things were okay and some weren't, and leftovers were not supposed to be sold. But they still did it. <laughs> and um, you know, you get heavily fined and maybe have your license you had one taken away if you sold something you weren't supposed to um, roaming through the streets. But outside of Paris, you know, it was the Wild West. <laughs> so, so that's what they would do, according to the commentators, with the food that was really rancid. You know, anything left, the leftovers of leftovers, they would take it outside the borders of Paris and sell it on dark streets. But other markets, because there were other markets in Paris, you know, street markets. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was happened at other markets too. Okay. And you know, the stands would be, it was perfectly legal. Um, you know, they were inspected theoretically. Um, but how thoroughly this was done. Oh, 
tiny one. Uh, so you're saying most of the descriptions that are made by people who are not eating this. Right. Um, right. Is there any chance there were starving artists, starving writers who are actually eating this? And yeah, could... yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying about But the also. descriptions, are they different? Can you, can not, you tell not... if this person is disgusted or just yes. trying to be disgusted? Yes. That's what I want to find <laughs> out. I, um, I need to see if I can, you know, my next thing is to see whether Picasso talks about this anywhere. I haven't found it, but I have not by any means exhausted. I mean, I suspect so, mm -hmm. and I've talked to art historians who are specialists in Picasso, who really think that, who are pretty sure he would have been eating this, because this is what poor people were eating, and this was when, this was right at the time he was starting to make his art. Um, I thought about studying this from the perspective of marketing because this hyperinflation of criticism it has happened. I never, you know, never thought of it in food, but when the upper class find they're being blocked yeah. by having a lower class having the same pretty much what they have, and especially enjoying it, they don't like it. Yeah. And, uh, there has been several cases that, that we study, you know, you see a lot of, like in the car industry. Yeah. And so they, they, they say, oh my gosh, that's horrible what they're doing. It's just because now it's just cheaper and it's the same thing. Right, right. Mine is the disgust of them. Yeah, <laughs> I, I haven't found, I haven't found upper bourgeois writers writing about it. <coughs> but it probably would I haven't found any really wealthy people who have written about it, maybe part because they are not writing. I don't know. I wonder somebody like the the, the vocal brothers, you know, who are very wealthy. Um, but would they want to write about it? I don't know. That's a really good question. I, you know, most wealthy people like to give their leftovers to charity. So, you know, they would send things to the Zanzar, you know, the, the, the nuns, you know, things like that. And, because um, they would over, over, not, they wouldn't themselves prepare, but they would have their servants over buy, over prepare, to put out this lavish spread because that was what opulence was about and it was about impressing people. Um, and so, of course, there were leftovers, and their solution was to give it to charity. But many of them knew, I just think most of them knew, that the servants were selling off the leftovers. And, you know, it was kind of like the, the servants' right. You know, they didn't get that well paid, and it was just like a tip. <laughs> so I think they just turned their head. You know, I don't know how much they thought of it. But um, that would be an interesting <coughs> angle to explore. Yeah. I, I, I would love to find more writing about it by other classes than the book But so far I have. Thank you very much. Yeah.